Example 135. The World Anti-Doping Agency funded a study to compare the effects of growth hormone on body composition and athletic performance in women. Among the 16 subjects assigned to the placebo group, the mean fat mass change after 8 weeks was negative 2.1 pounds with a standard deviation of 1.2 pounds. Among the 17 subjects assigned to injections of growth hormone, the mean fat mass change after 8 weeks was negative 4.4 pounds with a standard deviation of 1.3 pounds. Construct a 95% confidence interval estimate of the difference between the mean weight losses for the two diets. Assume weight loss is a normally distributed random variable and assume the two groups have equal variances. Does it seem that growth hormone has an effect on fat mass in women? Okay, so it's a confidence interval because of this phrase. Construct a 95% confidence interval and we're doing it for the difference between the mean weight losses for the two diets. So let's start by writing out the data for the problem and I'm going to start with the data they gave us first here. The data they gave us first was for the placebo group. So I'm going to begin with that group first. So the placebo group is going to have a sample size. The sample size here is just 16, so it's a small sample size, right? As soon as one of the groups has a small sample size, we're going to have to use the T procedure to construct the interval. So I know that I'll be using the T procedure now. The mean fat mass for that group the change in that fat mass was negative 2.1 with a standard deviation of 1.2. And these are in pounds, right? Okay, and then it says among the 17 subjects assigned, assigned to injections of growth hormone, so we'll call this the G group, the growth hormone group, and the N for that group is 17. The sample mean for that group is negative 4.4 pounds and the standard deviation is 1.3 pounds. Okay, so we have the placebo group, the growth hormone group, and now we have a confidence level of 95%. The confidence level is 0.95. That leads to the idea that alpha is 0.05. Okay, so we have all the data. Now our second step is to get our critical value. For our confidence interval, since the sample size is small, we'll be looking for a T critical value. And the T critical value is going to be alpha divided by 2, so it'll be 0.05 over 2. But don't forget here that in this problem we have a special degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom when we assume equal variances, so if we're assuming equal variances, is pretty straightforward. It's actually the sum of the two usual degrees of freedom. So what's the normal degree of freedom when we're dealing with a small sample size, a confidence interval? It would be n minus 1, right? And then this one, if it would have been a separate problem by itself, would also be n minus 1. So the degrees of freedom is actually the sum of those two things. So it's n minus 1 plus n minus 1. So if you write that out, it'll actually look like n1 minus 1 plus n2 minus 1. So that's the easy way to remember it. However, technically you could simplify this and just say what? n1 plus n2 minus 2. So if you've seen it written that way, it's the same exact thing, but it's basically the two sample sizes added together minus two. That's the degrees of freedom. Okay, so for our problem, what's that gonna be then? Our critical value will actually technically be the following then. It'll be T.025, and then N1 is 16, N2 here is 17. If we take away two from that, it's gonna be the same as adding 16 and 15, which is gonna give you 31. So if you work that out for yourselves, uh, n minus n1 minus 1 is 15 plus 17 minus 1 which is 16 15 and 16 make 31 okay so we have our degrees of freedom we have our critical um, values alpha level so we're going to go to the table look up 0 0.025 and one tail with 31 degrees of freedom and then we'll get our answer for our critical value okay so we're looking up 0 0.025 with 31 degrees of freedom so we're just going to move the table up a little bit so we can see that line and so coming down in this column, all the way down to we see 31 degrees of freedom, we find the answer 2.04. Okay, so we found the answer to be 2.04. Now that we have our critical value, let's plug it into our margin of error formula. That's E equals 2. The T alpha divided by 2, and then we're going to have the square root of and now we're going to have, because of the equal variances, we're going to have something called sp squared over n1 plus sp squared over n2. 
So we have to work out the SP and we have to plug in the rest of the numbers from the problem to finish this margin of error. So where do we get this SP from? Well, remember SP is actually something we can calculate from the data itself. It's like the pooled sample variance because we're assuming they have the same variance really, right? So we're just going to basically pool the two sample variances they gave us. We're going to do like a weighted average of those. So the way we're going to do this is pretty simple. We're going to take the degrees of freedom here. So it's going to be n minus 1 times the standard deviation for the first group squared. Then we're going to add to that n2. So this is n1 minus 1. That'll be n2 minus 1 times the standard deviation for the second group squared. And all of that will be divided by our degrees of freedom. So you can either write it as n1 minus 1 plus n2 minus 1, or you can write n1 plus n2 minus 2. That's the same as the degrees of freedom we use down here, just written in a different way, right? Just collecting the two negative ones and calling it negative 2. Okay, so let's plug in the numbers to get this sp squared thing. 15 would be the first uh, subtraction there, so 15. The standard deviation squared here would be 1.2 squared plus 16, right, after you subtract 1 from it, times 1.3 squared. And that will be divided by 31, right, 15 and 16 added together. Okay, let's see what that works out to be. So we'll have 15 times 1.2 squared plus, oops, I didn't write 15 there, let me type that in again, 15 times 1.2 squared plus 16 times 1.3 squared, and then hit enter, you get 48.64, and you'll divide that by 31. And when you're done, you get 1.5, 6, 9, etc. Okay, so we end up with having the answer to be 1.569 dot dot dot. I'm going to actually store that in my calculator so we can use it later. I'll store it as x, but if you're not going to use a store feature in the calculator, then just take a few decimal places. I would recommend using at least three or four, no less than that. Okay, so once we have that, then we're going to use that number down here in our calculation. So t alpha divided by 2 is 2.04. Then we have the square root of this number we just found above, so 1.569, you know, so on and so forth. It's already squared, so we don't need to square it. Be careful of that. N1 is 16. See, it's notated here as being squared, so when we just plug it in, we just use it as it is. When we squared these standard deviations, we basically did the squaring that would be done down here, so we don't have to do the squaring there. And then plus, same number, 1.569 divided by 17. Okay, so let's see what that gives us. So we're going to take 2.04 times the square root of, and I'm just going to use x because that's where I stored this number, right? Divided by 16 plus x divided by 17. Close it up, hit enter, and we get approximately 0 0.89006, let's say, right? So the error is roughly 0 0.89006. All right, now that we have this number worked out, our next step in the process is going to be to take that and add and subtract it to the differences of the means, and that finishes up the problem. Okay, so we have X bar for the placebo group minus X bar for the growth hormone group minus the error, and then we'll have the same thing but plus the error, right? Okay, so let's see what that ends up giving us. When we work out the difference between the means here, we subtract these two in our calculator, we see we're going to get this positive difference. It'll be minus 2.1 minus negative 4.4. And make sure you do this in the order in which we have um, the means written because that's how we set up everything in the problem. If we go P and G here, then it's P and G here. All right, so we end up with 2.3 for the difference. And we're going to subtract off our error of 0 0.89006. You know, and we'll do the same thing where we're going to add that error, so 2.3 plus 0 0.89006. And ultimately, let's see what that ends up giving us here. Final answer for the problem, 2.3 minus 0 0.89006, and then one more time, but the plus sign between them, right? Okay, so after all of that, we get 1.41 1 up to 3.4. One, nine. So that is our interval, and now we need to interpret it. 
So the important thing here is to be able to say the answer to this question. Does it seem that growth hormone has an effect on fat mass in women? Well, first of all, we're going to say that we're 95% confident that the true difference between the means is inside of here, right? But how is that subtraction done? So let's write that out first, right? We are 95% confident that the mean for the placebo group minus the mean for the growth hormone group group sorry is inside the interval right is inside the interval okay so what does it mean to say that this difference is inside this interval well, the fact that the interval is completely positive, that indicates that this first mean is larger than the second mean. In other words, it's a larger number. So what does that mean? How do we interpret these sample uh, differences or sample means here? When we look at this number here, it's to represent the fat loss that was achieved by the group that was taking the placebo injections. Well, they only lost 2.1 pounds, which is a larger number, right? A larger number than negative 4.4 but what that means is that they lost less weight right so be careful here a larger number means what they're closer to zero here that's what it means to say one negative number is larger than another one it means it's closer to zero which means you know they're closer to having lost no weight than this group right this group lost a full 4.4 pounds this group lost uh, 2.1 pounds so when we say bigger here, don't mistake that for meaning that they lost more fat. Actually, the opposite. Because the number is bigger, because it's closer to zero, it means that they lost less fat. So what you need to think of it as instead is that the placebo group is fatter than the growth hormone group at the end of the period where they did the um, intervention. So essentially, the growth hormone group seems to have lost more weight, right? Because they have a smaller sample mean. Since the number is negative, smaller means that it's actually more negative, which means they actually lost more weight. So in absolute value terms, the growth hormone group um, has the bigger mean. But you know, in, in actual numbers, when you uh, consider the sign, the placebo group has a bigger number. And a bigger number here means they're actually fatter because they didn't lose as much fat over the course of the intervention. So again, ultimately, what does this mean? It means that yes, growth hormone does seem to have an effect on fat mass. It seems that you lose more fat if you're taking growth hormone than if you're not taking it. And so that means that maybe the World Anti-Doping Agency needs to be careful and consider growth hormone a performance enhancing substance because if it has this effect on body composition, it may also have an effect on athletic performance. And it turns out that they actually did look at that in other studies and show that in fact it does seem, at least in these studies, that it has some effect on athletic performance as well.